Guys, welcome to this week's episode of Unleash Your Inner Greatness. I am very excited to introduce to you this week's guest. Lisa Messenger is the vibrant, game-changing founder, editor, and CEO of The Collective Hub, a multi-platform publication for entrepreneurs. Lisa is an international speaker, a best-selling author, and an authority on disruption in both the corporate sector and the startup scene. Having worked with corporations such as IBM, L'Oreal, Telstra, Facebook, Commonwealth Bank, and Estee Lauder. Her mission is to inspire human potential and challenge the way corporations think, taking them out of their comfort zone and proving that there's more than one way to do something. She encourages entrepreneurial spirit, creativity, and innovation and lives her life to absolute max. Lisa is one of the most authentic and soul-driven entrepreneurs that I've had the privilege to follow uh, during my time, and I'm, I'm really privileged and honoured to have her on the show. Lisa, welcome to Unleash Your Inner Greatness. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me, and I'm sitting here laughing because <laughs> <laughs> we had a few technical glitches in the lead-up, and it's sort of been like a long time coming, so um, Joseph just said to me, how long have I got you for, and I was like, you can have me as long as you want because it's been like a couple of months build up, hasn't it? But here we are. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's quite possibly the, the um, <laughs> well, you've written a new book called Work From Anywhere. So there's always challenges with IT. That's the one thing I've learned. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thanks for coming on. I, I'm really grateful. I'm, I'm honoured because I've followed your journey for a long time. Um, but Thank I want to ground you in a beautiful place and just ask what you're most grateful for in your life right now. And given, given your year last year, what was the highlight of last year as well? So what you're most grateful for and what was the highlight of last year for you? Do you know what? I'm most grateful for time and space at the moment um, and we can dig a lot more into that and last year um, I mean and gratitude around the most simple things and it's, it's too difficult to say quickly so I'll just do time and space for now and last year having the courage to break Collective Hub which was such a huge brand um, in order to remake it and so yeah that's definitely something I was proudest of last year and we can talk all about that and where it's gone since <laughs> that 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 was such a huge um i suppose announcement for you and i watched the interview with georgina um i think there was oh maybe amy when i dropped oh with amy yeah yeah, I, yeah with amy, yeah, amy really dropped it, yeah um so and obviously that journey is sort of what began you in the in the world of um, magazines and publications, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. What what was the sort of rationale behind it? Oh my god! Okay, see my previous book, Risk and Resilience. Um, so just by way of look at you, you've got like the world's smiliest face. I love you. <laughs> um, how could I like go back into like the heartache of risk and resilience and that year when I look at you? It's like all just happiness and joy. Um, I guess going backwards a little bit, like I started my first business on the 22nd of October 2001. So a long, long time ago. And for any sort of startups and entrepreneurs or I don't know, solopreneurs or a myriad of other things listening to or watching this, um, for the first 11 years of my business, I was kind of like over servicing and undercharging and being everything to everyone and didn't really know what my purpose was. And, um, I mean, I was having a fun ride and I could ever only ever work out how to have three staff and I was almost embarrassed about that and all these things. And then in March 2013, I launched Collective Hub as a print magazine into a highly saturated market of five and a half thousand print magazines in Australia alone and within 18 months the print magazine was in 37 countries and I had people like Anna Wintour inviting me to meet with her in New York and like this journey just got so huge and like it was unbelievable like it was incredible when I was just so clear on my vision that I'd never worked for the media or magazines and I just stepped into it in such a massive way and fast forward kind of I guess 
four years, three, four years into that journey. Um, it's interesting because as an entrepreneur or a creative or a visionary, which I am, you start something and it's exciting and juicy and adventurous and you're breaking every rule and you're messing stuff up and it's so much fun. And, um, and then suddenly I found myself in the middle of a very, very big global organization and it suddenly was all about systems and processes and operations and IT, HR, finance, legal, kill me now. <laughs> and I started hating it because I was drowning in operational stuff. And as a visionary and a creative as, and as an entrepreneur, that's not why I start things and that's not why I do things. And I couldn't care less about money for money's sake. And every day it became about money because we were kind of hemorrhaging cash. <laughs> and we just grew too fast. And so what became, and still is, my greatest purpose and the thing I love more than anything is like telling stories about extraordinary people and, you know, inspiring people through that journey. But I was like, I need to break this and I need to cut the absolute guts out of it because it was a highly inefficient organization. <laughs> and you don't know what you don't know until you're there, right? Like I'd never run such a big multi, multi-million dollar you know, business across multiple countries. And so suddenly I was like, this isn't fun anymore. And I'm kind of out of my depth. And um, so I broke it all. And by breaking it all, I mean, I shared every single cost. I got rid of my office. Um, I said to my whole team, do you want to be freelance? Do you want to decentralize everything? And so the last year I've been remaking it. And I tell you what, it's the greatest pivot I have ever done. And I'm freaking loving life. And yeah, I mean, you've got to be open to change and to be able to evolve and just move with it. And you never know what's coming, you know, and we can't always control what, comes at us but we can sure as hell control how we respond to it and how we deal with it so yeah <laughs> hey that's a big congratulations on that what's the, what's the biggest thing that you're proud of in terms of when you did decentralize it and you've gone more offline what what's what's what are you most happy about now that you sort of maybe were struggling with back then i mean i think the biggest thing is for anyone it's having the courage to know something's not working. I mean, Collective Hub at the time from a um, external consumer facing perspective was bigger than ever, you know, like, and it was, I mean, we were growing um, across print, digital and events. Like it was like this most incredible brand, but at the same time, the bottom line was just hemorrhaging and not keeping up. And I am the only one to blame. I didn't put the right systems and processes in place. And also, um, in nearly 18 years now of having my own businesses, it's changed so much. Like when we started, you know, everyone would work, I don't know, nine to five or eight to six or whatever. And everyone only had one job. And some of, we've done over 6,000 articles um, across print and digital over the last five and a half years or six years. And the most popular themes by far were working from wherever, being a digital nomad, being decentralized, you know, like all these different themes. And I was like, or having a side hustle. And so I thought, you know, if I'm not happy in this environment and my overheads are so high and my team are like, you know, they want to have side hustles as well because I'm preaching about how great it is to be an entrepreneur, then maybe I should just break it. That's my dog sneezing. <laughs> then maybe I should just be courageous enough to go, maybe there's a better way, you know? And that's difficult because a lot of people's identities are wrapped up in what they've created or, you know, it's a big ego thing having this huge business and, and it was almost a mark of pride, like, you know, or a success factor. How many staff have you got or how big is your office? So it takes a lot um, of inner self-worth to go, I'm going to break it all and I'm going to proudly say, now I work from home. Now, what's interesting about that is my businesses, I now have collective hub still in various iterations but I also have two startups and it's enabled me to be more productive than ever when I was in the office I was busy but busy and productive aren't the same thing you know like I was busy because I was reacting all the time and I was having to deal with you know meetings after meetings and systems and processes and HR issues and all sorts of things and now I'm like I'm really free to 
tap into all sorts of, I'm back in my creative sweet spot. I'm back in my genius zone. And I love that. I feel great. I think it's really admirable as well because I know, I mean, I know I was trying to get you on the podcast a couple of months back. And one thing that I really value that you said is like your time, like you manage your time and you said, you know, I honor, honor my space. And I think that's such an important thing. Um, I'm really keen to learn more about your, I suppose, non-negotiables because at the, at one time you said I've got, a non-negotiable where I don't do like a podcast before a certain time, for example. So yeah. do, do you have any non-negotiables that keep you immensely grounded at the moment that you love? That, yeah, that heaps. You- and, and also rather than like, I think when collective was growing at such a rapid pace, you know, I had non-negotiables, but I didn't always stick to them. And now I'm really clear about my boundaries, which doesn't always work for people when you're like, I'm in London, can we do a a Zoom at this time? And I'm like, no, I don't do anything before 10 a.m. And that's been a a thing of mine and not negotiable for a long time for many reasons. Even when I was in the office, I would say I don't do meetings before 10 a.m. And the reason for that is, again, it's really easy to get busy. And if I like literally jumped out of bed and, you know, went straight into doing a podcast or a meeting or whatever, it's like, I'm just into it. Whereas I know people are like, oh my God, you've always got so much energy and you get so much done. And the reason I do that is the rituals and the routines and the way that I set myself up for the day, which is, um, you know, time for me really so I listen to other podcasts in the morning and I meditate and I do yoga and I take my dog Benny for a walk you know there's certain things that I do I journal and I write and then like today I've had you know back-to-back meetings all day and lots of different things and I'm perfectly fine with that and tonight I'm doing a speaking gig and it's like bang 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 but I, I can do that because I had the first three hours of my day completely just for me and I think that's really important because otherwise we all just get busy and we start glorifying busy or like using it as a you know you everyone you see you're like how are you oh so busy (laughs) I always challenge people say something else like how are you actually I'm feeling really crap today or how are you actually I just had a great win thanks for asking like oh I'm so busy (laughs) (laughs) just you know it's um I think when people answer like that it's not a very conscious way of answering and I would also say if you're answering like that catch yourself in the moment and go well why am I so busy um and rather if I look at what my purpose is and what my ideal day looks like and what I really want to achieve then can I reframe that and maybe not be so busy and go actually I'm having three hours to myself in the morning and then I'm going to do what I want to do during the day and I'm going to do this podcast with Joseph because I love him and it's been long overdue and so I'm really happy and it works you know (laughs) yeah it's funny because of all the interviews that I've done to date there's one thing that comes up a lot and it's obviously mindfulness and meditations actually come up a lot with high achievers yeah yeah uh, yep. I, I went into a bookshop um last week and i thought of you actually because i picked up this book that spoke about the hoffman process oh yeah i know nothing about it but you popped into my head for some reason because i think you mentioned it at some stage or another um and I know this podcast is about self-worth and self-belief. Um, I want to help people with that in their entrepreneurial journey. But yeah. I was just wondering, have you done any radical things in your life that have really helped you create a really great or helped you improve your overall mindset? Yes. L- like, the, <laughs> like the Hoffman or something like that? <laughs> I'm the queen of radical. Yeah, I'm a massive believer and actually perfect because it was 2004 when I did the Hoffman process and I did it because before that point in time I was kind of leading life according to other people's expectations I didn't really know who I was or what I wanted out of life (laughs) um I hadn't spoken to my parents for like three years I was drinking a lot like I was just like a bit of a mess really and um And so I I just overheard someone talking about the Hoffman process. And I was like, I don't know what this is, but I just need to do this. And it was this extraordinary cathartic experience. And 
um, yeah, it was basically eight days of kind of locking yourself in a retreat, no phones, no technology, and really looking at um, what had been holding you back in life and, and what are the negative patterns, you know, and looking at what's been passed down by the generations and looking at childhood issues and doing all sorts of cathartic rituals, actually, like bashing pillows with baseball bats and journaling for hours and going to bed crying and waking up crying. <laughs> I'm just going to plug my computer in. Um, so, yeah, so that was kind of the start of that journey. And I came out of there like a different person. And I literally, um, my mom and my dad became my best friends on the planet. I gave up drinking um, in October, uh, November, 8th of November, 2004. So what's that, um, nearly... 15 years or 14 and a half years ago and I just made radical changes in my life and really it just helped with the mindset um, and since then I've put myself in ridiculous situations that are completely counterintuitive to my everyday western life so um, in the last two years I've flown to India twice and spent time in the Osho meditation center which um has has since unfortunately the um wild country documentary on netflix has come out all about it being a sex cult i think it was in the 60s <laughs> people are like oh is that where you went <laughs> and i was like note to self note to self stop talking so much about the cult that i go to um <laughs> but no it's not a sex cult anymore but you do wear purple robes head to toe all day every day and that's like quite amazing because there are people from all walks of life from all over the planet and the fact that you're all wearing almost a uniform which I can't stand you know at a head level it actually removes all um sense of identity and judgment because no one's like oh look at what she's wearing or look at what he does so it actually is this incredible leveler so I purposely do things um, all over the planet that make me feel uncomfortable um, so that I can just reset where I'm at and what my belief system is and kind of then integrate those quite spiritual learnings into my day to day. But I mean, I know not everyone can jump on a plane and go to India or I mean, a sweat lodge in Costa Rica, which I've also done. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, but they can do something counterintuitive and just go to the next suburb or, you know, listen to a great podcast or read a great book or watch a great documentary or, you know, just there are other ways to just challenge yourself and be counterintuitive to what you do on a daily basis. And for me, that's kind of where I get my mindset shifts um, from. It's I um, thanks for that. I appreciate it. I resonate somewhat. I just come back from an ayahuasca retreat. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Oh, yeah, yeah I certainly have. Where, it's, in the Amazon? Or? Uh, no, in Portugal. Ah, uh, how is that? Uh, immensely deep. I think I remember on your podcast with Kerwin. Yeah. Uh, Kerwin Ray. Yeah, he's done it yeah, as well. Yeah. So yeah. It, was, uh, it was a real profound experience, similar to what you're describing. So I've, uh, I've come wow. back a little different. <laughs> Um, I have not yet done ayahuasca. However, I have been in some pretty wacky places where there have been several other substances like <laughs> in Costa Rica and things. And yeah, pretty, pretty trippy experience. Wow. Good for you. Yeah, it's really, really enlightening. I think the re why I'm passionate about talking about it, because I think, you know, you can fabricate success, but at the, at the, yeah. at the root level, like if you haven't sorted out your things from childhood or and this is not for everyone but if you haven't sorted out things that are keeping you back from your greatness and i really believe yeah. that's things from the past you may have been bullied or you may have been you know you may have lived in a in a mm. home that was quite emotionally turmoil or you know just all those things mm. i think if you haven't dealt with that you can't become your best in business yeah oh and i love that and i i love that this conversation i think is becoming a little more mainstream and because it's challenging right when people haven't done any work on themselves to go maybe you should look at your childhood issues and people look at you like oh are you what's wrong with you but it's yeah. like i mean i've done so much you know work on myself across so many different modalities over the years and it's like i'm 
perpetually fascinated by it and what you can kind of pick up when you're like three or seven and these moments that have this massive impact on you at the time and then we hold on to them you know through our years and and then we get triggered in different ways and I'm fascinated like when you go back to the the start of that and you deal with it in some kind of cathartic way and then it just gives us this huge unveiling and um yeah and then we become limitless in that area and i freaking love that and some of the things my sister and i laugh about it all the time like some of the things that you know we were both in the same situation in childhood but it's impacted us in different ways and we've both done quite a lot of work and she's like as um, crystal healer and she does all sorts of other woo-woo stuff and she's amazing but we talk about it and we're like wow you got that from that experience and wow you've just thrashed that out for the last 30 years god i didn't get that at all <laughs> so yeah i think it's i think it's one of the most magical things that someone can do is go back and really explore what triggers us and for yep. me it's always ego and it's like reacting to something and it's it's always comes from a pain body of something that i've experienced before and i think as soon as i realize that it's like the awareness around it and then going wow that like and i still do it like oh my god my ego is out of control because something triggered me and so i fight back how dare you or i hit back with ego and it's like it's horrible but i we're know human. it doesn't make it, it doesn't make it right <laughs> <laughs> but we're human you know yeah and yeah, we, yeah, yeah and we get compassion for our parents as well because they obviously were doing their best you know i know and that's it with hoffman i mean was so beautiful that's when I mean my mother and I had such a toxic relationship before that and then went through this whole process and I was like oh my god I could not love you more like I just love her she's incredible but yeah that whole thing changed my entire outlook on everything that's awesome yeah. I'll, I'll put the um I'll we'll, we'll put the link in the show notes to maybe where the experience is if someone needs to you know go through it um I yeah oh and since sorry since then no, I've done twice something called path of love which is like next okay. level hoffman it's um yeah that's pretty confronting but if people are ready to really dive deep go for that <laughs> and what what okay let's just go with the journey what was that about was that about relationships uh, or <laughs> um yeah so hoffman was very i mean there's so many different you know things um but hoffman for me was uh quite like it was a great um dip my toe in the water kind of situation i think because i'd never really done anything much and um and every hour it was like okay now you're rebirthing now you're meditating now you're burning stuff in the fire so i was like wow it's like this real ride for me um path of love is much more free-flowing and i would say definitely not for the faint-hearted probably for people who've done a lot of work already but it's really um still no it's not really about love with just it's about like love, universal love, and how do we um, drop all this ego and how do we drop all these things? It's just a whole nother level of it. Yeah, it's pretty powerful though. Awesome. Yeah. You, yeah. Your, your first book was, was it Happiness Is? Oh my God, you're good. Yeah, so I wrote that in 2004, a long time ago. And, yeah. and you went around um, interviewing, was it right? When I'm right in saying that you went and interviewed people to ask them what they believe the answer to what happiness is? Yeah, it was, um, so it was around the time that I, well, it was just after I did Hoffman because I'd been so unbelievably unhappy and, um, just, you know, as so many people are in their twenties, like just really stuck and didn't know what my purpose was. And so I ended up just going around Australia and asking people, what does happiness mean to you? And, and that was, yeah, my first book, I self published that in 2004 and managed to do like crazy deals. I sold, I think 36,000 copies of that in the first 12 months because I looked at it differently. And, um, yeah, a publisher at the time, it would take like four years for them to um, you know, look at an unsolicited manuscript or whatever, like the statistics were pretty dire. And a lot of books in Australia at the time, I think were selling 300 copies and a bestseller was like 5,000. So that was my first foray into rebellious publishing, I guess. My, um, my theory around it was that corporates were spending so much money, God, now you're taking me back, <laughs> um, on inanimate objects like squeegee balls and golf umbrellas and coffee mugs and mouse pads and stuff. And I was like, well, 
why wouldn't they buy a beautiful book on happiness? So I did all these deals. I remember I did a deal with Mercedes Benz. Like, um, imagine if you could go and do a test drive with Mercedes. And as you left, there was a book on happiness on the seat. So um, Mercedes used it to incentivize test drive. And then um, Clinique had a perfume called Happy Hearts. And I was like, imagine if, you know, people bought this perfume, but they got a gift with purchase of this happiness book. So yeah, I did all these deals. And that was where my thinking um, really started. I mean, Collective Hub was like that on steroids, but I've always loved the way that you can think differently and challenge um, paradigms and challenge industries and challenge the status quo about how things have always been done. And I think really in Australia, I was the first person at the time who was doing special sales with books. So yeah. That's awesome. And what was yeah. the ultimate theme of the book? Like, what was the most common answer about what happiness is? Do you know, it was so funny. Um, it was very surface level. I mean, I didn't ask them. It was um, a beautiful photographic book with, you know, just a few paragraphs, but it was a fascinating uh, study into social norms or people's reaction about what they should say. The majority of people were like my family or walks on the beach and which is beautiful. And <clears throat> in retrospect, I would agree that for me, definitely, um, the things that bring me the most joy are really simple things in life. But I also think that people weren't prepared to challenge challenge themselves beyond surface level answers. And in fact, I remember distinctly when I pushed people a little further, um, a couple of people actually got quite angry with me because they were like, no, I don't know what it is, or actually I'm not happy at all. <laughs> so, I mean, it's actually interesting what people are triggered by sometimes the most simple of questions and and a lot of people I don't think know exactly what makes them happy or what their triggers are or you know they're just I don't know people get stuck in jobs don't they because someone said they should do it years ago and then they get on the treadmill and suddenly they've got a mortgage and 2.5 kids and they need to like continue on that treadmill and they never are courageous enough to stop and go actually this isn't working for me i want to change it so yeah i i've wrote i've written daring disruptive money mindfulness breakup and breakthroughs life and love purpose happiness is risk and resilience work from anywhere work from wherever yes work yes. From wherever. <laughs> yep. um one thing growing up that i suppose i mean I grew up in quite humble beginning, great, great beginnings. You know, dad and mum worked multiple jobs to give us opportunity, but there was always a sense of scarcity around the home. And yeah. I've always sort of tried to overcome the scarcity mindset, specifically around money. And I think money precludes so many of us from following our dreams, that and probably fear. Um, yeah. I'm keen to know, just from your point of view, like this whole money um, and mindfulness discussion, my question was actually going to be which book you're most proud of, but I wouldn't mind uh. <laughs> personally about the scarcity mentality. Do you battle with it and, or have you battled with it in the past? And if so, what's a great way for people listening in to develop an abundant mindset in all they do? Yeah. So that's a great question. Thank you. And you're good. So I've actually written, a lot of books, a lot more than that, but Probably the truth is that, no, yeah. but no one read the first, I don't know, 18 or how <laughs> I wrote so many books. After 2004, happiness is, I wrote a lot of books, um, but no one really read them until daring. And I mean, they did, but not like now, like now they're getting more prolific, but daring and disruptive was the first in this series of seven that I wrote, which was in, 2014 after I launched Collective Hub and the reason I've written so many and I will get on to money and mindfulness is that I wanted people to understand like I didn't want people just to look at Collective and go that's so big that's amazing and I wanted them to understand the story behind the story and the struggles but also the way that I did it so literally I've been writing books for the last five and a half, six years in real time every single day. And so the topics change depending on what I'm going through. And so I think they've become really relatable and attainable and people are so beautiful, but they're like, oh, she's just like me. Like she has no idea most of the time either. 
Money and Mindfulness was the second in the series. And the reason I wrote it was so much of what you've just talked about. I mean, for years, um, I felt mm, like a lot of this childhood stuff that we come back to. I felt not good enough or not worthy of making money. I felt like doing good in the world and making money um, were mutually exclusive, like you couldn't do both. Um, I just, yeah, I, I just felt like money was a dirty word for such a long time. And because of that and the negative connotations I had associated with it, I wouldn't allow myself to step into making money. And I mean, I talk a lot about this in Money and Mindfulness because my mom, when we grew up, I mean, we grew up, we had a, we went to a great school and things, but we were probably like one of the poorer families in a more affluent area. But I remember my mom like literally putting post-it notes above the toilet paper saying, just take two sheets, please, or something like that. And I was like, mom, what was that? She likes to now say it was for environmental reasons, but like, really, she just was like, you know, you're on the toilet paper, you're like going through. So I grew up with, I grew up with this feeling of, scarcity and you know inadequacy around money and we can't spend much and you know we go to a movie and we'd take our own cordial bottle or whatever it was yeah. so yeah so it takes a long time to um take yourself out of that childhood memory and what has become not you know your norm um so yeah, I write a lot about that in Money and Mindfulness and around lots of rituals that I have been doing over the years to, um, to negate that feeling. And now, I mean, I, I still couldn't care less about money for money's sake. Like it just, I don't care. That's not what drives me. But I care a lot about it because, I mean, I freaking love money because it drives, um, you know, it, it gives us platform, it gives us choice and it gives us freedom. And what I've learned is without money, we really can't, do a lot you know so I'm all about making money now I mean it nearly killed me with Collective Hub you know three million dollars plus in salaries and oh my god the overheads in that business were just insane and as I said before the bottom line just wasn't keeping up with the brand and so not having money in that circumstance you know my vision was so big and still is so big but I was constrained because I couldn't make money fast enough to keep up with it and I know so many mistakes that I made and that's why I broke it all so that I can rebuild it in a much more sustainable fashion. But I mean, yeah, money can buy freedom and choice. And um, yeah, I mean, there, there are many people I just had, I had breakfast with an amazing woman who I adore, Erin, who um, founded Triangle, incredible um, brand. And she just did a podcast with another friend of mine. So I think I can talk about it, but she, this business triangle bikinis grew so quickly. Like I think it was something like, um, I'm making this up, but like $5 million turnover in the first year and something like over 300 million, I think quite quickly. And she had all the money in the world and she said, I've never been so unhappy. And so that's the thing. You see that a lot. I think it's really important for people to have a really healthy relationship for money um, be able to make lots of it, but know that money, in and of itself isn't the answer but if you actually have the ability to choose you know what to do with it and you can create platform and freedom and choice to do what you want every day then absolutely it's great so yeah I mean I've covered a lot of those themes in um in money and mindfulness and it's something I'm very passionate about I'll link those in the show notes all the books ah uh, yes so good, good, we, good. Can, we can help get your message and your learnings to the listeners Thank um, you. And it's funny, I, I relate because I, I, I remember back in the day, like, be, <laughs> be, <laughs> be having a shower and literally, like, after two minutes, it'd be, mum would be literally, like, banging on the door, <laughs> like, get out. And it was just scarcity, you know, because obviously she, you know, the hot water was expensive and it's just, uh, anyway, we all Yeah. Know. But you know what? I think it's also my... um boyfriend and I we talk about it a lot like and we actually love it that neither of us are complacent with money like we not we yeah. like nice things and we have a nice lifestyle but um oh god what was it like a couple of days ago something about spending a hundred dollars on something and I said to him I really hope we never just because it was something ridiculous I really hope we never get complacent and we're just like oh who cares it's just that like we're still very conscious and mindful about where we spend money and we're not frivolous and what we do is we question ourselves at times like 
huh, is that just a belief from my childhood? And actually, is that ridiculous? Or actually, you know, is this, and can I step into that because it's okay to buy something nice for myself because I deserve it? Or is this actually something that is kind of ridiculous? So we're always like questioning ourselves on different decisions, but it's, it's a really healthy relationship with, with money. That's awesome. What you value um, tends to stay with you as well. Yeah, I think so. I found that the hard way in a relationship. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I actually come into your world after I lost my marriage uh, in 2014 and I read your book. Oh, Breakups and Breakthroughs? Yeah. So that's oh. how I come into your world, which was, a, it's been a really interesting journey. Um, yeah. So that was a, yes. obviously a, 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 an interesting part in your life as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, yes, so, well, so yeah, I don't know what to say about that other <laughs> than thank you. Thank you for reading that book. And I'm sorry you also had an experience. I'm glad my heartbreak at the time could assist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the, yeah, that's the power of writing. It can help a lot of people. Um, I think I was, so, yeah. I, I was going to say, you know, the, the process of manifesting dreams is, you know, it's so powerful, law of attraction, etc. Do you have a process that you go yeah. through to set your goals and intentions and to manifest what's important to you in life? Um, I have a number of things that I do. Um, and a lot of them have been adopted from either things I've read or more often than reading probably like actual cathartic processes that I've been through. So, you know, you can intellectualize something and you can read about it on a page and it helps us. But I find until I put something in action for myself, that's when I actually, you know, the deeper learnings happen. Um, but I 100% know um, when I'm in flow and people will relate to this. Like when, um, you know, when I put energy towards something and that can start with, um, oh, here we go, in front of me, all day, every day, I'm drawing like mind maps and <laughs> I don't know, but, but I, I scribble and doodle and write and I've got a whole notepad right here that I've been doing today on different things. So I draw all the time physically. Um, ideas, this is where I want to go. Like pretty much every day I'm drawing circles about this is what I want things to look like. Um, and then, you know, I have other ways of visual visualising, whether it be, um, you know, sticking bits and pieces, you know, on my windows. Downstairs in my house, house now, I have like drawn all over the glass with like every time an idea comes I scribble it all over the glass in the spare bedroom because it's like a big wall and I used to do that in my office all the time so there's certain things and it's almost like when you get into that flow you I feel into something so deeply and so authentically that suddenly it just comes and I'm like thank you universe there it is and Anyone who does this will notice it's, it's the only way I can describe it is you're in flow. And when it comes, you don't do this like, Oh my God, that just happened. It's almost like you just expect it. And you're like, thank you. There it is. Thank you. There it is. And the converse of that is when um, collective hub really started hemorrhaging cash and it wasn't a fun place to be every day. I felt like I was walking through mud, like suddenly. And it's interesting when I was growing that brand, I had no idea how to, um, well, A, how to launch a magazine or how to do a magazine. But because um, I put it out there with such a clear intention, what I wanted to do, every day, like people would contact me and want to be a part of it and the right people would fall into place and distributors would happen. And it was just like, oh my gosh, this is, it just happened, you know? But as soon as I tried to control it and I was like, oh, this is hard and oh my God, I don't know what to do. It was just like walking through mud again. And so my biggest thing around that is like, Finding a way to get really clear on your purpose. Um, mine is to be an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs, living my life out loud, showing that anything's possible. It's that simple and it's that complex. And I hold that very near and dear every day. And it's what I live my life by. And the rest of it, it's like, I just surrender and detach from outcome. Now, you know, that sounds, again, counterintuitive to people who are like, oh my God, but I just want it now. Or that makes no sense. What? Surrender, sit here on a rock and sing Kumbaya and wait for it to come to me. <laughs> it's not that. It's about um, just knowing within yourself. And I've had to do this in the last year. I was like, wow, you know, be a global brand, breaking it. You know, there's something very sexy about having a print magazine in 
37 countries for some reason print you know people still love it um to going wow what is the next iteration of that like how can i still step into my purpose and best best be of service and you know i had to sit with that and just kept, keep asking that question and um I'm doing another startup at the moment, which is a big manifestation of that. And I'm so excited about it. So, that's, yeah. That's so awesome. Um, yeah. I was going to say legacy drives and motivates a lot of people. And what, what do you want to be remembered for? Like, what would, what's your ultimate legacy? My ultimate legacy, absolutely, is just... Um, living my life out loud, showing that anything's possible, you know? And so I feel like I'm a bit of a human guinea pig and it's not always easy because I permanently purposefully step into really difficult situations and I challenge myself every single day. But what I realized is that when I do that, I help other people um, because I think there's not enough people sharing authentically what's going on behind the scenes. And so as difficult as it sometimes is to be like, oh, I just had a breakup, here it is. And you know, oh, I nearly lost my company, here it is. <laughs> it's only through me <laughs> sharing my stories and being really honest and vulnerable and authentic about it that it actually helps other people because I think there's so much on social media at the moment you know all you see is the glossy fabulous life and you know people flying around in their private jet you know like there's so much crap out there which actually isn't true at all and so for me i'm just like well what you see is what you get pretty much <laughs> um so my legacy very much is just helping people to switch the light on a little bit and step into you know the greatest version of themselves I wrote down, I'd wrote, written down because one thing that I know that you're really good at, Lisa, is building a tribe. Would, would you, you say, would you say, that's all right. Would you say that <laughs> given that, you know, given that you are authentic, do you think that's why you've been so successful to build a tribe that's loyal to you? Thank you. I, yeah, I mean, I think the thing is this, if you set out, um, building a business or, or anything is really interesting. I think there are these people who set out to go, I want to have a huge tribe and I want to have a huge brand. And that's what they're trying to do. But actually, if that's your goal in and of itself, it doesn't really make sense. Whereas if you just go, I want to make really cool stuff and I want to inspire people, then the brand and the tribe just happens, I think. And so um, I remember doing a speaking gig a while ago and someone in the audience said something like, oh, I just want to be like you. I want to be a speaker. And I just was like, why? You know, <laughs> like, I, for, because the, re, the thing that they were saying is almost like, I want to stand on stage so I can have an ego or like, and I was like, but why? Like, I never chose to consciously stand on stage and tell my story or, but I was like, this is what I want to do. Ugh. I guess I better get good at speaking because if I'm really going to have a voice and a message, then I need to be able to spread it across multiple channels. You can't, you can't have a voice if you're like a shrinking wallflower in the corner. But I would just say to people, get really clear on what it is you want to do. And if it's just about building numbers on Instagram or doing whatever it is, and that's just associated with your ego, then that's the wrong reason. But if you're like my mission in the world or my passion or my purpose or my why is this, it's just going to happen. You know, if you're doing good stuff, I think people innately want to just be a part of it. So, yeah. That was probably my favorite part of the conversation. I really, I'm going to take Aww. a lot away from that point. I really resonate with what you just said. So thank you so much. That was absolutely awesome. Um, thank you. And I can give, like maybe, do you want me to follow that up with a real life example about collective? Like, Go for it. Uh, Cause that was a real powerful part. Um, I love the whole sense centricity around purpose so yeah over to you go for it yeah I mean I like it because that's you know as I said before after 11 years of having my own businesses um and kind of fumbling along and not knowing how to scale and it was like literally I came up with this idea like I'd been doing books but they're very one-dimensional in comparison like a magazine's much more complex and um and I literally was like I just want to do something great I want to tell great stories about extraordinary people and tell the story behind the story and make it um 
raw and real and attainable and relatable and kind of answer the, but how did you do it? Why did you do it? And that was, that was all. And so because that was such a strong thing within me, um, it just, all these things just started happening. Like, like the first time I dropped an issue, like people just started sharing it and people would go, like, I remember one guy, Jeff, who I didn't know went out the back at Avalon airport and like started unpacking boxes and helping. And so this tribe literally pretty much overnight just exploded because everyone wanted to be a part of it. And I think that's one of the greatest things, like know what your purpose is and give people um, the chance to belong or have a sense of ownership. And that's what I did with Collective. I always said, whilst I own it um, financially, unfortunately, a lot of the time, I don't own it. Like you own it. And so people, if you give people a a sense, a chance to belong, they will, they will become part of something automatically. I think that's the thing. Whereas if you're coming at from, I want a big tribe and I want to do this, like people are like, ew, you're pushing stuff onto me, but give them a chance to belong that people will become a part of anything that you do. Awesome. Um, I've got some rapid fire questions and then one last question for you. I have, okay. so, I have so many questions, but we'll, we'll just uh, value. We'll have to do an episode too. hundred <laughs> percent. Um, <laughs> So my first rapid fire question is what's one thing people can do to live a happier life? Probably simplify things and hug people more often. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot more I could say about that. I mean, my boyfriend, we've been together three years. He's, um, he, we never talk about it publicly, but he is probably one of the most extraordinary entrepreneurs I know. And both of us are like, you know, in business, these big um, adrenaline fueled moments, like we both love business, but at the end of the day, it's like family, friends, and just hugging each other. Where That's when we're our happiest, like truly. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's, thank you. What's one thing people can do to live a more purposeful life? Well, firstly, I think get brave enough to really ask yourself what, what juices you up, what excites you every day, where can you be in service? And um, yeah, I think they're the simple things like try and dial it back and go, what is it that, what's the best use of me rather than living life according to external expectations? And what's one thing that people can do to live a regret-free life? Ugh, well, <laughs> you just got to reframe it to think that everything that happens is a lesson, you know, um, you just can't have regrets. I mean, people often say to me, wow, you're so happy. And uh, after Collective Hub, I mean, I sold two properties, um, made $1.3 million profit in 2017. I put that whole $1.3 million into bridging finance for collective and lost it all. I never will see that again, wow. but I'm, but I'm, I'm so happy because the thing is I just reframed it to be like, well, that was a bloody expensive <laughs> lesson, <laughs> you know? And if you live with any regrets at all, you cannot step forward into your true purpose. Like you're always going to be, oh, but what if? And you're always going to be coming at things from an angry perspective. And so everything that happens, I'm like, well, that was a bit of a bummer and I didn't see that coming. <laughs> but okay, what can I learn from that? Stuff happens. Money's just money. It comes, it flows, it goes. You just can't be too attached to anything or have expectations of anything or anyone, I think. Thank you. And I've got, so my last question is this. Imagine it's the end of your life and I handed you a piece of paper and a pen and you had one piece of advice that you could write down for future generations to help them to believe in their inner greatness. What's the one thing that you'd write on that piece of paper? I mean, I, probably something around be unafraid um, to do whatever it is that you want to do. And also know that absolutely anything's possible if you truly step into it and have a go. Um, yeah, I, I've done, which I've written about, one of the most powerful, crazy exercises I've ever done in my life was having to go in, in one of my wacky things that I did, lie down 
by a gravestone in the cemetery <laughs> and pretend it was mine and like lie there and meditate for quite some time and imagine that it was your funeral like it's pretty dire and imagine what people were saying about me and I was like oh my god I tell you what that's one of the most powerful ways to get off your ass and be like I'm gonna live every single day um to the fullest of my ability with no excuses because um, I don't want people going, nah, she could have tried harder. Nah, she wasn't that great. She had so much more in her. Like I want them saying, wow. wow, she really inspired people. She really left a legacy. God, that Lisa messenger was a little go-getter. <laughs> so, you know, there's things like that. I think it's powerful to kind of think about what would you write? What would you say? What do you want to leave behind? It's a little bit gloomy sometimes, but it's, <laughs> it's very um, cathartic. I'm so happy you ended the interview on that note because um, I think a lot of people take away from what you just said, the exercise, that's really powerful. I think the, our mortality is one of our biggest uh, drivers. I think, you know, people, yeah. when they visualize that, they really, <laughs> they really think that life's short and it is. So yeah. um, is there anything else that you would like to impart with the listeners as part of your time on the show? No, but I just want to say thank you because you have truly one of the most beautiful, infectious, amazing energies. And even though we're not in the same room, um, I just want to honor you for that because you are like a beautiful human. And thank you for tracking me down and being persistent. <laughs> it's been very special to share this time with you. So. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, thank you so much. I wanted to acknowledge you. You are, I wrote down a few things. Um, I, I do think you're a very powerful, um, beautiful soul. Um, and I think humanity is a better place because of you. Um, you're humble, gracious, and very giving. I'm immensely grateful for the wisdom that I've personally got through your books, um, your talks, and your courage to be real, raw, and honest, and always serving entrepreneurs with true heart. Um, you inspire me to follow my dreams. Um, I do have a big dream to step into entrepreneurship as well um, and to help other people elevate them to greatness. So um, I'm really grateful that you come on the show. <laughs> we, we nutted out all the technical issues and this has been one of the best interviews um, I've had the privilege to do. So thank you so much. Aww. Thank you. Wow. Well, I look forward to seeing you in person soon. <laughs> of course. And guys, um, uh, the link to Lisa's books will be in the show notes. Go out and buy her books. Um, just quickly, just on your last book, Lisa, can you just give us just a very, just oh. 30 second synopsis of, yeah, put Here it, it closer, to, closer to the screen. Oh, can Work you see? from wherever. Yeah, just yeah. give us a... It's very beautiful. Here it <laughs> is. <laughs> give us a, just a quick 30-second synopsis. We'll link it in the show notes as well. What can people uh, expect from it? Well, it's kind of for um, solopreneurs or digital nomads right through to um, entrepreneurs and then intrapreneurs, so people working for big corporates. And it really empowers you to have those conversations around how can I actually set up a work life that is according to my dreams and how can you do that while still achieving um, and that's what I've done with my whole team people are working now from all over the world my entire workforce is decentralized and I don't mind if they go to the beach all day because it's all based on output as opposed to hours in the office so I don't know so far everyone's a lot happier I think and more productive so it's really talking about that and how we've managed to do that amazing you're going to change so many lives through the book guys get the book it'll be in the show notes um guys you know what time it is it's time to go out there and unleash your inner greatness 